Good afternoon and welcome to Real Talk right here on SABC3. So, for over two decades, we have been captivated, engrossed, enthralled by this lady with her bubbly personality, her charismatic nature, and this energy that just never seems to end. We were introduced to her through Top Sport, but we know her mainly for top billing. She's done the bar on Manhunt. If I had to describe her in one word, well, besides talented, I would have to say consistent. And I'm pretty sure by now you have figured out that I'm speaking about Ursula Shikane. Oh, <laughs> consistent. Consistent, aren't you though? I like to think that I am. I think you are. Con From the first time I saw you to now, you have never dropped the ball. No, I've dropped the ball. People just haven't seen. People didn't see, which, yes. is, which is consistent. My thing is, if you're going to cry, you cry at home. Nobody oh. should see you crying uh -huh. and nobody should see you floundering. Mm -hmm. So it's that thing with the duck. Oh, underneath, so underneath you paddling on like top. crazy. But yeah. on top, it's like, yes. I can do this. I can. So I have this theory about Bono, right, from you 2 yes. that he is the world president, right? Now, when I think about you, you strike me as the world head girl. Oh. Yes. Oh. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> The head girl, her hair's always done, she's always neat, everybody loves her, she can talk to everyone, her skirt's always right. Do you know what I'm saying? That's you though. I never thought of myself as head girl. At school, the highest ranking I had was as a prefect, mm -hmm. and in the drummies, I was a baton twirler and a flaggy. Uh -huh. But when you say head girl, I understand what you say, because at the convent, our skirts were measured, couldn't be higher than four fingers above the knee. Mm -hmm. Your hair had to be perfect all the time in the plaits and stuff. But I never always was that girl yeah, yeah. in the box. And there are pictures to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> is, is there like a picture with you and green hair somewhere that we haven't found? No, but there is a picture of me at about 10 years old with masses of hair and these elastic bands trying to Ooh, hold the, the hair yeah. in, like really straining. Yeah. And you can see on my blazer, it must have been um, cool aid stains and all sorts of things. And it was a day we had to take photographs at school. So I was not looking <laughs> like the head girl. But in, in TV, you learn when you're shooting that mm. there should be no distractions, oh. minimal jewelry, no noises. Your hair is not allowed to be flying in front of the camera. Mm. So you learn to edit as you go. Simplify it. Yeah. So back to 10 years old uh, in the convent, what kind of person were you in school? Were you the one doing all the debating, the speeches? You know, if netball tour happened, you'd be the one to report back. Was that your vibe or were you shy? Ah. The shy, retiring girl with an amazing sense of humor okay. and no sense of self. Um, we started, my first two school years were at Bosmond Second Primary. Babe from Bosmond. <laughs> B-O-B. <laughs> and then we went to the convent from Standard 1 until matric. Uh -huh. And going from Bosmond Second Primary to St. Catherine's to it seemed like a whole different universe. Mm. And you, I just felt like a duck completely out of water. I didn't know who I was supposed to be and how I was supposed mm. to be. So for a few years, I was trying to, to find myself. Mm. So the shy retiring girl came out. So when you say that you didn't know who you were supposed to be, do, did it look like other people knew who they were supposed to be? So it was kind yeah. of a comparison game that you were playing. We were the first black kids at the school. Mm -hmm. Nobody else looked like us. They didn't speak like us. Mm -hmm. there, were, there were people there with Scottish accents and freshly off the boat from Portugal, Portuguese oh. accents. And it was just, I'd never, I mean, come on. 1976, the country was in a riotous uproar. We were at this convent mm -hmm. being followed by ABC News from America. It was just bizarre. Mm -hmm. How is a child of eight years old supposed to grapple with all of this? And then seeing everybody else carrying on as normal because they had been from preschool to yeah, they were standard used one to together. This. They were yeah. used to it. And then here were us lot sticking out like sore thumbs going. What is going on here? Yes. So that was, that, it, it was quite a, a traumatic thing when you think Can back imagine. on it. But then something inside you goes, hang on, soldier. Strap up your boots. 
put your big pickle panties on, on <laughs> and go to war. Deal with it. So at school, you would be this one person that fitted into that world. And you'd go and home. And then you would go home and you would fit into another world. So when does the, the broadcasting bug bite? Nine years old. Really? Watching Rian Kreivachen doing the noose on SRE car. Uh-huh. Yes. And I looked at this and I thought, man, that looks like a really interesting thing to do. And then also watching Dorian Berry and thinking, well, there's a woman doing what the man is doing. And I would take my suitcase or um, the milk crate, mm -mm. put it in front of the basin in the bathroom. And you would have and a little And the bathroom news. mirror was a nice TV size, uh -huh. nice monitor size. And then cut out articles from the Sunday Times and read the news. Nine years old. Were you ever trying to be convinced to do something else? Because, I mean, you know, there, there's the careers that, you know, the engineer and... So you were never even phased about that. You knew you were never going to try and even go down that route. No, I wanted to be a politician. Because we were highly politicized. Uh -huh. My family is highly politicized. We've married into highly political families mm. as well. And I always did think that I would end up in politics. But my destiny mm. was cast at nine years old. So was this what you always wanted to do? Like, did you always know that you want to be a broadcaster? I didn't know what it was called back then, but I'd always seen myself as either a history teacher or as a politician. Uh -huh. And broadcasting, as it happened, was my destiny. Uh -huh. And it found me at nine. I didn't know back then. But by the time I was ready to enter the world of broadcasting, I was doing my final year at Wits Tech. Mm. And one of my classmates, Kim Ivings, she was Ivings back then, she was doing her prac at what was then to become um, Tiger Brands. Uh -huh. Jungle Oats wanted to start a youth sports program. And Kimmy was doing her internship and they were talking about this show and, but there's something missing. They had already had done the casting. They had 12 vibrant, amazing young people. And Kim said, I'm at school with this girl and she is, she's cute, she's sporty, she does all sorts of sports. Yeah. She's bubbly. Let me send her for the audition. I went a few days later. My first and only audition ever. Ever. I dressed badly. <laughs> I didn't know a thing about makeup, but I made a joke about being awkward and the camera seemed to like that little spark. Yes. And they said, that's it. Done. You're in here. You're in. Now, most people, when they say, you know, you started off in sport, the first thing is, oh, you know, sport's such a male-dominated area. Yes. Well, yeah, w w it was as bad back then, right? It was so bad back then. Uh. Um, I think I was one of maybe only three female sport presenters and the only black female sport presenter. Mm. I started off with, with junior sport and then made my way into top, top sport. Top sport, I remember you on top sport. And that, that was, it was a hideous experience for me because I was juggling as well. Mm. I had newly started on 5FM with the World Chart Show. World Chart Show. Oh. Which was to become my best effort. Do you ever. know that no one has done a chart show that good since you left, right? And I'm not just talking about 5FM now, I'm talking about across the country. I think that there's a reason behind that. Oh. It's because it was produced both in Hollywood and here at home. Mm. So we would get a pre-packaged, half-produced show the CDs, the labeling, the script and everything. Mm. And then the production team in Johannesburg. And we were the only country in the world that went live. Everybody else packaged theirs. Uh -huh. And we would go live with all the production notes. So you can imagine the stresses on the producers. All I had to do was just read the script. <laughs> I just had to announce. Uh. And then I think the show ran for 12 years, uh -huh. five of which I did on my own. And yeah. then after that, they were like, you know what, Branch, you've been doing this for so long. Just do it on your own. Mm. Because all around the world, it was done co-hosted. As a co-host. And then I just took it and ran with it. <laughs> Listen, I want to take a quick ad break. When we come back, we're going to talk about you and Kilimanjaro. I want to know, right? I want to know all about that story. And you touched on it already, Brown Sugar. I want to know how that name came along. Join us after the break. Don't go anywhere.
And we're back. If you're just joining us, you're a little bit late. But don't worry. <laughs> you're going to catch the bulk of the show. Today, our guest is Ishla Shikane. Before the break, I wanted to know from her, where did brown sugar come from? You know, lots of people think that a marketing team came together in a room and that they worked and, over this. And there was like mind maps and plans oh, and all of no. that. What happened is that in 94, 95, I went down to work in Cape Town on a, the regional Western Cape station. Mm -hmm. And the lady that brought us our toasted sandwiches, teas and coffees in the mornings, mm. she was getting used to all our names and we'd be sitting in the, the, the production office and then she'd say to Vince Gibbons, here you go, Vince, your toasted cheese with tea, one sugar and milk. Yeah. Charlene, here's your coffee, black, no sugar, da, da, da. Here you go, Ursula, your coffee with brown sugar. Mm. And then eventually she would just go, here you go, brown sugar. And it stuck. And it stuck. So from there, people started calling me brown, brown sugar. sugar. And I liked it a lot. Uh. It stuck and it's been with me ever since. Do you not ever worry? Because you know you get advised when you're in the industry. You know, you're a personality. Use your real name, you know, on, on radio. Just, you know, like Mark Gilman, Mark Pilgrim, Gareth Cliff, Ursula Stapelfeld. Did you not want to use your name? You see, Ursula Stapelfeld is not a broadcast-friendly name. True. I love my original name, <laughs> but it's heavy and weighty. Yeah. Ursula Chikani is snappier, shorter, and works. Yeah. Brown sugar as a moniker on radio, as a handle, absolutely was brilliant. Also, for that time, I had a, a listener send me a long religious email. Do you not know that brown sugar is another name for drugs and da-da-da-da? And as a public figure, you should be responsible. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's another <laughs> name. I think for heroin or oh, something. Oh, really? You know, like Mary Jane. Oh, yeah, yo, the blow. Yes, All right. yes. No. But brown sugar, I mean... Can you imagine if you had to have a Twitter handle, Ursula Stapelfeld? You wouldn't have any characters. I don't <laughs> think... I don't think there is enough. No. You wouldn't have any characters. No. Your no. tweets would just be high. <laughs> Bye. But Thanks. People still <laughs> call me Stapelfeld. Really? They, they still do. And I've been Chikani for... Eight Six years. Or, is it eight years? Yeah, oh, eight, you know better than I it's do. Eight years. Oh. Now. I, was, I was actually saying, one of the guys on the team were like, when did she become Shikane? And I was like, eight years ago. He's like, I've been living under a rock. I'm like, yeah, hope it was finished because you've been there for, you've been there for a while. Now, here's the thing. Everyone's got a, a story about how they got onto top billing. Mm. Because Patience Stevens, who is the owner of top billing, she always, she, you know, she always comes like, you know, just, just like sneaks next to you and says, hey, you. When was your hey, you with Patience? Cape Town, I was doing a, a horse racing color commentary uh -huh. story for, for Top Sport. And I had already had a number of Wimbledons under my belt, Gunston 500s, mm -hmm. Beach Bonanzas. So by the time top, uh, top Billing found me, I was already a young outside broadcast specialist. Yeah. And she saw me in action and she came up and she said, hey, I think you'd make a great addition to the top billing team. And top billing was so young then, they, yeah. weren't, they, they hadn't started shooting in the houses. Um, oh, so it hadn't hit the or, mansion Or they had Glam just vibes. started, oh. yes. And the top billing walk and talk hadn't been invented yet because Madam wasn't there yet. So Did you invent the walk and talk? No way. The hand on the hip. Sideways, glide across the tiles. The good night. <laughs> So you were around the time with Bassi and uh, Mo, uh, Michael Mo. pre Bassi, pre-Michael. I was top billing presenter number three. Out of all the places that you found yourself going to in the world, which one still sticks to you? Antarctica, because that was on my dad's bucket list. Uh -huh. um, we grew up in a house surrounded by books. And my love of reading comes from that and my grade one teacher. And these places were in the Encyclopedia Britannica. Mm. And Dad would talk about these places as though they were mystical. And when they said, OK, you're off on another top billing jaunt, you'll be out of the country for three weeks, back for one and then out again. And one of them, by the way, is Antarctica. I said, I'm taking it. Uh -huh. I'm absolutely going. I don't care. I don't care how cold it is. I don't care if the, the, the food is going to be frozen fish uh. and water. <laughs> I, I am in there, like swimwear. Where have you gone because of top billing and because of work, and then you went back 
out of your own accord this time because you were like, I want to go on holiday there. Because, you, you know, you say you land and you're working all the time. Just a place where you were like, I want to go there and enjoy this on my own terms. The Masai Mara. Really? Did you go back? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then when we did Bar One Manhunt, um, Franz Hoff and Vague, he put that on the list as another place to go to because everybody was still just so in awe. Yeah. And then that took us up to Mount Kilimanjaro. And I, I think that everybody should start a traveling fund as soon as they can. With five cents, ten cents, mm. start your traveling fund and your collagen fund as soon as possible. Now, when you speak about Kilimanjaro, I read somewhere that you didn't have to climb it. I didn't. You have didn't to. have to climb it. They said that fly you in and you do the opening link and do the closing link and you know make it look good for TV. But something in you said, no, I'm gonna climb it. It's not the way. It's not the way we're made. Uh. And this was with the the Manhunt production. I was the the only female on the crew. Yeah. Um, later on, another production company would take it to SABC One, yeah. and it changed, and it just didn't have that thing, mm, that thing, that thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I thought, you know, if all these guys have to to do all the challenges, I am fit and strong. Yeah. I've always been sporty, athletic. I'll make it, even though I summited a good four hours after everybody else. Yeah. It's only the only girl on the team. Your pit stops are longer than theirs. Yes, because you actually have to find a place to squat <laughs> <laughs> where no one can see you. Where no one can see you. And then everything is frozen to everything. And it's, ah. Mm. But an absolutely amazing experience. Life-changing. Uh-huh. And your, did you not have problems with your breathing and your, and your cardiovascular there? Um, towards the top, I did. And my guide actually said to me that he is not carrying a corpse down. Mm. And I, I should prepare to, to go back down again. And I said to him, well, how much further do we have to go? And he, he said, it's just maybe 45 minutes to Stella Point mm -hmm. and then another hour and a half maybe to Uhuru Point. Mm. And I said, if I make it up to Stella, Mm -hmm. Will I have summited? And he said, yes, you just wouldn't have been able to take the picture. And I said, my brother, as it is now, I can still put one foot in front of the other. Though at that altitude, just lifting your foot a centimeter feels like the biggest accomplishment in the world. Sure. I said, I can still breathe. I'm not dizzy yet. Mm -hmm. He said, okay, I'll make a deal with you. As soon as you get dizzy, just a little bit, we turn around and go back down. I summited. Mm -hmm. I did. She did it. And by the time I did, the boys were coming past me already. <laughs> and you're like, that's okay. Listen, you want to stay exactly where you are. After the break, we'll talk more about her jet setting lifestyle and a freak accident that changed her life. Stay with us. And welcome back to Real Talk right here on SABC3. Still with us on the couch. What a conversation we are having. Ms. Ursula Shikane, I need to talk to you about this. You call it a freak accident, right? Yeah. Um, you were shooting yeah. and you slipped. Sure. It happened the day after my 39th birthday. Mm. And we were shooting at, we were shooting top billing links. And we had just watched an insert that one of the production members had worked on. Mm -hmm. And I was going with my link script. I was fully dressed and made up. And I was barefoot, carrying my link script and my pair of shoes mm. to position one. And the home had these highly polished floors and mats that didn't have the rubber underneath. And all through shooting the location itself, the cameraman kept saying, somebody is going to fall and hurt themselves so badly. And, and yeah, people were slipping and landing on their glutes and on the shoulder. And even the, the um, interior decorator slipped down the stairs. I slipped and they saw it happening in slow motion. My body lifted, turned, and then I landed on my chin and then my face hit the floor. Ooh. So you didn't fall down something. I, all... I slipped like that and landed like that. So, and you, you landed obviously head first? First on my chin and then my mouth crashed into the concrete floor. And I'm so surprised that I can speak so 
calmly about yeah. it because normally when I speak about this, I just, it, it still is a bit traumatic. Why, why is that? Is it because you, you know that it could have been worse or, or it, do you just keep on replaying it in your mind? You do. You, you get uh, that trauma because uh, the instant my, my mouth hit the floor, my lips blew up, my eyes, I was bruised already. I lost four teeth and I lost gum and bone. And it mm. just, it was, was... Was it so as it happened? No, because your body has a way of protecting you against okay, that. Okay. But the consummate professional, I was wearing a Vera Wang dress, which was light in color, and I made sure I didn't get a drop of blood on it, even though I was, my face was lying there in a pool of blood. And even when we took it, Robert Bell, the, the stylist, was like, mm. go to the hospital in the dress. And I said, there's no, no way. The dress is not the property of the production company. So you, un you undressed, undressed and got dressed again in your stuff. In my own clothes and sped off to the hospital where a maxillofacialist came and cleaned me up. Mm. And um, then I went to a specialist dentist who then had to extract what was left of the one tooth that was there. Mm. And then I had my lips stitched up, top and bottom. And I've recently had um, cortisone injections to try to dissolve the, um, the scar tissue mm. in my top and bottom lips because I'm tired of the bump now. It's so 10 years. How does it affect you now? Is, is, do you wake up when it gets cold? Does it get sore? Or no. Like okay, <laughs> no. okay. <laughs> no. So then I had, I had re dental reconstructive work and I've had um, bone implanted and gum reconstruction mm. and I've got an innovative um, dental implant system that my dentists worked with oh. me on. So, yeah. I don't suppose you could sue anyone. <laughs> no. Look at me looking after the I, money. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> no. I mean, not top billing, not the house owner. Do, do you <laughs> know, everybody just took such great care of me in that stage and nobody spared any expenses okay. and it was an accident. Mm. It was, it was just an accident. I don't know why it happened, but I did then go into a three year self-imposed exile. Mm. I buried myself in a hole. So you did not get out of your house, you did not do gigs, you did not do any TV work? I didn't do TV work or I didn't do TV work that would have me in a close-up shot. Mm -hmm. I would do TV work that they could do medium close-ups and wides. Did you, did you feel that you look strange or something's happened? Yes. Because, okay. Yes. So were, 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 was there something wrong though with you? Or there were was. you just like projecting? No, there was something wrong because in the beginning I had temporary implants. Yeah. And they were like, if you can imagine chewing gum like chiclets. Okay. Like it, they, we were working on an old antiquated system uh, and I had holes drilled into what was left of my gums. And because I didn't have gums to cover the length of the teeth, when I smiled, you just, these just long, be teeth. It, it just <laughs> horrible, horrible. And I became the girl that smiled behind her, her uh, hand. So you'd laugh with your hand in front of your face. And retreated into myself. Um, what I did do was corporate work, stage work, mm -hmm. and if there was a live to screen camera, I would speak to the camera guys and say, just don't, don't go in on a close up, keep it as wide as possible. What got you out of the, you know, the deep, dark three year funk, if you can call it that? It was, it was, I, I forced myself out. I, I had to, I just, I had to. Um, I, I would go to gym every single day. Yeah. You, I, I knew that I had to find a reason to get out of the house. Okay. And so that was gym and CrossFit training. And I was still shooting and nobody knew that I was suffering silently and, and looking. I mean, I would look at myself in the mirror and I would just think, who is that freak? Mm -hmm. Where is that smile? So, so what I'm trying to understand is why did you not feel that your talent was enough to just, for us to see past the teeth? Because TV is a very cruel medium and nobody wants, I'm so glad that things have changed now that people take you based on not necessarily what you look like, but what you can offer. Mm. Um, 
and especially doing the country's longest running, highest regarded glamour show. Okay. It just, Anele, I really did look different and my, the shape of my face also changed because my jaw changed. And I didn't want to bring the rest of the production down. I didn't want to hold anything up. I didn't want to be treated with kid gloves and as a special case mm. to get away with anything. Uh. And I think more than the looks, because I've never thought of myself as beautiful, so thank you very much. Thank you, makeup artist. <laughs> my voice and my ability to speak and communicate was mm. taken away from me. And why I say that the dental implant is innovative is because instead of having just one unit drilled into my, my gums, my um, dental team were able to put a slit between these two teeth okay. so that I have a bit of sibilance, so that I can, I say to them, listen, I don't just want to look okay anymore. I need to be able to speak properly mm. and in order, there's so many things you take for granted, just mm -hmm. that little slit between your teeth that make you say the words properly. Wow. And I wasn't able to, to speak properly. And that really got to me. I wasn't able to communicate the way I was previously. Okay, so on the way, I know that you do a lot of work with the Smile Foundation and it makes sense, you know, with what you went through. I wanna discuss that and Ursula, the businesswoman, okay? Cause I know outside of broadcasting, uh, you know, there's some things that you, you do on the side. I've worked for you before with your, <laughs> you know that, I know that. that don't, she's looking at me like I'm making it up. She's like, mm, girl, you are lying to these people. No, I'm not, and you'll see why. Stay with us. And we're back, we're still with Ursula Chikane. So we know that she wanted to broadcast from the age of nine. She was a very sporty lady. And we just covered the freak accident that changed her life, which is why you did a bit of work with the Smile Foundation. It was quite close to your heart. Absolutely, you know, Anele, once you have your smile literally and physically wiped off your face, Dude. and then you have it given back a number of years later, but you can start smiling with confidence, you want to give back as well. Yeah. And I found that the work that the Smile Foundation does with children, especially with cleft palates and cleft lips is amazing and life changing. So they would go into deep rural areas and educate the moms and make them aware of how there are possibilities to prevent cleft palates and cleft lips by taking folic acids during pregnancy oh, wow. and another of, an, a number of other things. I mean, honestly. I didn't know that. You know, moms were literally locking and hiding their children with cleft palates and cleft lips away because they didn't know how to explain it. Mm. And very few people knew that they were actually repairable. Mm. So you see these before and after pictures of little babies with the, the missing gap in the top lip or the, the, the cleft palate and then the after photos of these kids and the smile the smile is from monday to <laughs> sunday and that really resonated with me the people underestimate the power of a smile yeah so the night before you came back and you you, you finally said okay fine that's it i'm going back to tv they can do their close-ups all they want uh, this is me was it like a sleepless night for you or were you just like you know what i'm going back to my love which is broadcasting i don't care <sighs> I was so nervous I can because if you haven't practiced your craft for a while, you do become a bit rusty. Mm. Obviously, your 20,000 hours just kicks in. I know Michael, Malcolm Gladwell says 10,000 hours, but I mean, two decades, I think, you, I think you've pretty much rallied up 20,000 hours. 20,000 plus tax. <laughs> so, because you are a broadcasting powerhouse, I can't not ask you this question because mm. I know there's people watching and they want to be presenters and, you know, we have to pick your brain. Would you say presenters are born or are they made? Either. It depends on how badly you want it. Uh -huh. Either. When, when we started out, the game was completely different. Mm. And we did a lot of slog work and we weren't able to, to monetize and True. take it advantage of the opportunities 
the way the new generation of broadcasters are able to. Mm. And I think that these days, very much, if you're willing to put in the work, as a broadcaster, you're also a business, which we weren't back then. If you're not willing, really, a lot of people will say for the sake of magazine column inches, oh, it's not hard work. It is hard work. Mm. It's hard work making sure that you're always camera ready. It's hard work doing your research and prep. Mm. It's hard work standing in front of the camera with that smile genuinely plastered on your face for take after take after mm. take. And it's hard work eating the food that you have to eat. Mm -mm. We had an experience of one presenter that sort of moonlighted with us for just a few weeks because when she found out that it wasn't... It wasn't all the glam. The glitz and glam. Yeah, it wasn't all glam. And this is the thing people don't realise about top billing as well, is that, yes, the product that comes out of the TV, that's glamorous, but the hard work behind that, including the presenter, is something else. It's completely different. They see the edited version of what goes on. And this young woman wanted sushi for lunch, and <laughs> the crew laughed and said, yeah, no. Yeah, a sandwich. We have takeaway <laughs> burgers and there's no sushi. Oh, but this is top billing. Yes, but this is the working budget. Yeah. Get with it. This is top billing, but you so, everything yeah. else is bottom. Come on. <laughs> Don't worry about come it. Come on. So who makes you better at what you do? Who's this person that you know you know you can call and they're there to make, to, to keep you on your toes, always honest with you? My family. Mm. Always, always, always have been able to to keep me just grounded. Um, we're a tight-knit family. We always have been. Six children. I'm well, the middle one. Okay. Well, sort of. I'm number three of six. Okay. I had an argument with a friend who said that myself and my little sister, we were joint middles. <laughs> <laughs> no, I am the middle. But my family is incredibly supportive and real. There is no big oh, deal. Oh, Ursula. It's mm -hmm. Ursula from the TV. No. None of that. Because I'm still the girl that will go home for Sunday lunch and help clear the table and do the dishes yeah. if I haven't had my nails done. <laughs> but And I'm still the girl that walks around. I mean, last night I was on air. I was wearing a pair of shorts, a top, and I was barefoot in studio. I love oh. being barefoot. So when, when you have a family that doesn't buy into the, the hype... hype it certainly does help. When you've got people around you and all they're doing is hyping you up, you need to take a step back and say, what is in it for them? Yeah. If somebody is on your crew and they don't have the guts to say, listen, you're dropping the ball here, you're missing calls, or you're taking on too much work, mm. cut back a bit, or you are now almost overexposed, pull back. Would you say that's an issue with the industry today, is that um, we, 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 we are flirting with the very th la thin line of overexposing? You know, Anele, if I were to come back into the industry, if I were to return to TV, I would be coming in, I would be coming in as a beginner. Which and is not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing because I, I learned what I did mm. back then. I'm now unlearning it and relearning what you guys are teaching us. Mm, mm. I, you know, Jason Roberts, who was with me at 5FM when it was still Radio 5, he said to me, look, you are, I was on, I think, three TV shows plus 5FM. He said, you're going to be overexposed. He said, every now and again, pull back. And that's what I did throughout my years on TV. I would do gladiators and then disappear for three to six months, back onto top billing, do that for three years solid, disappear, mm. then do bar one manhunt or just keep disappearing. Okay. You need to, to, people need to miss you a bit. A little bit. Give them just enough room to miss you. Yeah. And so I asked you, who makes you better at what you do? Family. Oh, yes, I want to know now, what do you do? What makes you better at what you do? Like, what religious thing do you do? Are you reading a lot? Do you make sure that you are meditating a lot? You know, what act are you doing to make sure that you're on top of your game? How did you know that I'm a praying kind of girl? Ah, oh, because a I can lot. see the spirit. <laughs> a lot, a lot. I'm very deeply rooted in my faith. I'm a, a cradle Catholic. I strayed from the church and, and 
came straight back again and I've, I've, I've done all my searches and I am back home and a practicing sacramental Catholic mm. and it's wonderful. It's, um, I'm one of those old school strict Catholics now. I try to do things convent by girl. the book. Convent girl. And it was the convent that had me running away from the church. <laughs> but life booted me straight back in again. Because you found it on your terms now. You weren't finding it because you were being taught it at school, you know. I think you, you mentioned something about turning 40 earlier during the break. And I want to talk about that later, actually. Your, your you know, your... your, your Evolvement. There we go. Yeah. But I, I, I think you're saying you're straight because it was always taught to you and it was kind of like given to you. And when you find it, then it's yours. Pope St. John Paul II very famously said, we are not Catholics on our own terms. And with, I mean, with, with any religion, I suppose, people go, but, yeah, but there are too many rules, this, that, and the next yeah. thing. And they take the bits that work for them. It's a buffet. Which is what I used to do. <laughs> Canteen Catholic. <laughs> and once you get why the rules are there, once you get, yeah, once you get it, mm. you just get it. You do. So I do devotionals and I pray novenas and I do the adoration chapel and yeah. Mm. Okay. Last time, we need to take a break for the last time. We're gonna talk about the business because I keep on forgetting to ask you about that. And then, I don't know if I'm gonna make you cry again, but we must speak about Simba. Simba? You must speak about Simba because Simba was very close to you. And you were quite instrumental um, in giving him a, a wonderful send off. So we, ha oh. we have to talk about it. I know she's gonna cry and it's gonna be my fault. Stay with us. And we're back with the lady who does not have the luxury of having a bad day at work. If she has to be on camera, it is on. There is no time to feel sorry for yourself. But do you remember that when I did a talk show, uh, Cheeky, Cheeky Media did Tongue in Cheek. Yes. You came on and you directed one day. Yes. And you were quite remarkable at it. Would you do that, be a director? Yes, I would. And the only reason I say that is because... I haven't watched TV for about a year and a half, two years. Okay. Because I just see too many subpar productions. Okay. So I, I love giving back and I love sharing the expertise. Mm. And I would go and, and direct one or two shows. Absolutely. Because I want to see people shining in the best mm. possible way. I don't... I, 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 Angers it grates you, I can see it. <laughs> to see yeah, who gets the flag, the presenter. Yeah. And I just think that people need to start sweating the small stuff. Yeah. The, the presenter needs to look and be as fabulous as possible at all times. Uh -huh. And I don't think that our industry is, is resourcing shows enough. Uh -huh. I know that budgets haven't been cut that much. Uh -huh. But don't take what's meant to go into the production budget and put it elsewhere. Don't cut all the corners. Don't. Lighting, sound, all those things. Just do it. And if, it, if you need a floor manager, get the get floor, a manager. floor manager. So you pretty much get the business of things. Are you still involved in other businesses? I know you used to do in-flight entertainment for a certain airline. <laughs> and by in-flight entertainment, not like she used to be in there dancing during the flight. She, she used to curate the in-flight entertainment. Do you still do that? I, I've, I've since stopped doing IFE um, because it was, it was time heavy and I, I simply just don't have the time. Um, it was something that I enjoyed tremendously, yes. working with people like you. Yeah. Um, I've, I found also that the skills that I've honed over the years are really helping me now with um, coaching executives, which I do, yes. Okay. And I, I do workshopping. I, even with established broadcasters, I find that everybody has got this thing, they've got strong weaknesses, and I beat them out of them. I don't like to say to people, work on your strengths or work hard on your weaknesses or whatever. Yeah. Don't. If you're going to work hard on your weaknesses, you end up with strong weaknesses. 
So they come to me and I get to bully them and and intimidate and even CEOs. Because <laughs> so, it's very important as a CEO to be able to address your staff. You, it, I think people yes. don't, don't realize how important it is to be able to speak in public. You get people who are comfortable in intimate small rooms, boardrooms, they dominate. As soon as Mr. CEO of a multinational company has to stand up on stage at a gala dinner, he ums and ahs and falls apart. They crumble. So the first time I had um, a PA phone me to say, could you please coach Mr. Big at our multinational corporation? I was like, I could make yes. some money out of this. Yes. I could make some money out and of this. And I said, well, I don't always do it for the money, though. Mm. And I said to the PA, please, when I get there, I just need an empty room, an auditorium. And it's just going to be myself and Mr. CEO. Mm. And you need to be gone because you know how PAs are. Mm. Please don't speak to Mr. CEO like that. Please don't sit it. And I needed to speak to him on a level that we both could handle. And be honest with them. And I've got a knack for it. Mm. So speaking of being on stage, auditorium, I was watching this on TV, the, the funeral service for Simba. And you were on stage. And you dignified the entire thing, just by the way. You really held it together. And uh, it was a special and a befitting, uh, you know, goodbye. Yo, how did that hit you? Hard. Um, starting with the Saturday that we found out that Simba had passed, Sureshi Ryder, mm. Sushi, she was messaging me. And we were in a, a workshop with my, the, the radio station I'm at. And I thought, well, Sushi's on air on a Saturday. Why is she messaging me continuously? Mm. So I sent her back um, a text and I said, in a workshop, is everything okay? And she said, Simba's passed away. And I excused myself from the workshop. And I, I said to the, the, the news crew there, I said, guys, can you please... Can we make sure that this, this really has happened? So I used the radio station's resources. And then we found out that it was indeed true. And then one of the first things I did was phone Jonathan to make sure that he was all right. And then phoned Cape Town patients and all of them. And when we went to visit Simba's family to pay our respects and sympathize, Bussy asked me if I would MC the funeral. For me, it's a very weird concept. Right. And I understood it to be that, yes, it's going to be a, a, a large funeral, but it's going to be friends and, and family and, and fans and mm. that. I had no idea it was going to be televised. Do you get a chance to be emotional and fully feel it when you have to be at the helm of something like that? Or did you go home and you fall into a heap of, you know, of emotions and let I it just out? thought I, you know, I'd had some one-on-one -on -one mentoring moments with Simba where I'd said, okay, this is where you can polish your game. This is where you can tighten up. This that. So if if he saw me falling apart on stage, he would say, yeah, but that's not what you're you not taught practicing me, lady. what you preach. <laughs> and I just thought, no, I can't. I can't let him down. And I know I did, I did waver from time to time, but it was real emotion. And there are times that you can't help the emotion. Mm. There, mm. there are times that you don't need to be the stoic professional. Mm. Love life, what's happening there? <gasps> oh, look, we're out of time. <laughs> I need to where, know. <laughs> where does this come from? I just need to know that. You're well, glowing. Let's just start there, that you're glowing. And, and you said, oh, it's a 10, it's a 10, it's a 10. OK, it's it, a 10. Yeah, 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 it's a 10. But I mean, is the glow like from in an internal place of happiness? I am eternally, internally and eternally <laughs> happy. Um, I have, I've reached a stage now, the, the, my divorce is two years old. So I think that that, that respectability window is you, done. You have respected the cows. You have respected <laughs> the lovola. <laughs> So, I go on dates, not lots. You'd be wasting if you weren't going on dates. You would be wasting all of this. Anele, yes. the amount of frogs that were there before I got married have doubled. <laughs> so, ah, look at you! No, they're, 
there are loads of frogs. Oh. And I'm not about kissing frogs anymore to find the prince. I'm done with kissing frogs. Dude. But, I, but I'm sure it's nice to age when you still look like you looked when you're 20 years old. <laughs> yeah, but that's why I said earlier on, you've got to start your travel fund and your collagen fund. Uh -huh. So the, the thing about, about aging is that it's the elasticity of the skin. So I have um, these treatments called Titan, uh. where they stimulate collagen growth. So you don't need to go cutting on yourself. And with the hairstyle I have, I can't afford to go cutting mm -hmm. on myself. So I just, every two and a half to three years, do the tighten. The cheeks are nice and fullness. Nice and firm. Nice and nice full. And nice and so full. when we do an episode on how to keep looking 21 at 50, will you come back to the show? Not 21. <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> Who looks 21? You do, Ash, you do. Oh, no. <laughs> I said to your makeup artist, I'm stuck at 37. But 21, ridiculous. Ridic no, I would, and I wouldn't want to be 21 again. Not for all the tea in China. No, thank you. Keep it. Even for an Hermes bag. No. Uh, none of that. Ash, thank you so much for joining us. This was a treat. Because you never do interviews. And I know you don't. But we got you out of here. And I'm glad that it was us that managed to get you on a chair. You sneaky, sneaky <laughs> girl. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it from our side. Thank you so much for joining us. Do remember that you can win yourself a 5,000 Rand e voucher from at home. Make sure you go to our Twitter page at Real Talk on 3, as well as our Facebook page. From our side, thank you so much for hanging out. Bye bye. Thank you.